Yeah, I get around. Hey, I'm okay. Now, you're gone. No, no, it, it's not wrong, but sometimes I cry when I hear that song. You remember? Hey, I'm all right. How was your flight? You're in Singapore or Shanghai. I... I don't know why. Hey, but I'm okay. I heard he was from Austria or Australia. A successful guy, not a failure. He's a CEO or a CFO or I don't know. But I want to let you know I'm okay. I got a job. I work downtown. I got a job. I work downtown. passengers. The next red line train to Braintree is now arriving. Next stop, Kendall MIT. I am Paul Matisse and believe it or not, I did build this 28 years ago. The first time I came down to the station, I had thought that I wanted to make something that would be put into motion by the trains. But then I saw that when the train came, everybody forgot about the station and got onto the train and left. So I thought maybe the better time would be between the trains when you're waiting. So, so figuring out these things just step by step without knowing where you're going is sort of the origin. But I did want music, mostly. And I wanted music reverberating. That's not music. <laughs> now I'm Seth Parker. I was um, passing through the T station, well, it was sometime last summer. And whenever I've had an opportunity to come through here, I would take a few minutes and either play with one of the um, instruments or another. And when I grabbed the lever arm for this one, I realized that there was no resistance. In fact, nothing was happening. 83 was when I got the commission. And um, then the installation was, the first installation was 86. Then we went on from there. Then I finished the other two pieces in 87. And, uh, and then I fixed them. And so it got the wheels turning and I thought, geez, something should be done. So first I made a series of calls to the MBTA and first I spoke to the station manager and he passed me on to someone else and I finally found the right person who's in charge of maintenance and including the artwork. And he was receptive to a volunteer group coming in. 
Well, Galileo um, was the one at the very end, was sort of the recognition of Galileo as a precursor of the scientific era. And so it was like a thunderclap that um, said, now look out. And Kepler was because I was working on this ring. And um, I, of course, wanted it to, it to be absolutely round. But after the fabrication, it turned out that it was a little bit out of round, which made it into an ellipse. And then, of course, one thinks of poor Kepler, who was trying to make the formulas for the circles work for the planets because if God had made the planets and the whole shooting match, wouldn't he have made perfect circles? Of course, but he failed and eventually he decided to try the formula for an ellipse and bingo, it all fitted together. Pythagoras was because when I first started, I realized I didn't even know how, why, people chose a certain note as a certain frequency, or, or vice versa. So I had to go back to my first year physics book and found myself reading about Pythagoras. So he was the beginning of all this business and I thought that I would just name the piece for him. What better group of volunteers than a bunch of MIT students who probably are technically very capable, and maybe are musically um, inclined as well. My name's Mike Tarkanian. I'm a technical instructor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and I've been the kind of technical lead for restoring the bells. And you know, each one of those pendulums probably has 30 parts inside of it. So it looks pretty simple. Wow, yeah, yeah. But when you take it apart and, you know, there's all kinds of things going on inside that we had to either fix or clean up or address in some way. I, I actually would have liked to have been involved in the hands-on part of it, but I'm pleased that it went along even without me. The long-term secret, including when this one breaks again, which of course it's bound to do, is that there'll be some con continuity at MIT. So as the students graduate, other students will take their place and uh, the Kendall Band Preservation Society will live on. And maybe that will be my role to, you know, make the occasional call now and then to make sure that someone is, uh, you know, carrying the torch. It's a great thing, yeah. It's a, it's a transition, it's a wonderful transition. It's sort of, there's also the Harvard-MIT connection. Here I am at Harvard, barely passing my physics um, class, and yet I love the music, and I made the music for this station, and so it's really like a handshake between the arts and the sciences. And now the sciences are shaking back in taking it on to keep it going. And I love the fact that the art is lost somewhere inside everything, but any given piece can be replaced. Look, it's so beautiful to see it happening again. God, I can't believe it. Everyone in here is happy today, men, women, and children. They are all celebrating India's 50th birthday. As they say, behind every darkness, there is a light. 50 years from now, India was occupied by an empire. But there was a man who dreamed 
that it can make India a free country. And he followed those dreams. And finally, he gained independence of India. He was a true superhero in the world. His power was greater than any of the fictional superheroes. Using non-violent methods against his enemies was one of his greatest powers. From a shy boy, he grew up to become one of the world's greatest leaders. He was the man who defeated an empire by using his non-violent methods. And this is not a movie. This is the story of that hero who made history. And his name will be remembered forever. On October 2, 1869, a new child was born in Porbandar, India. This child had no idea what lay ahead in his future. He had no idea that he would become the greatest leader or that his name would be remembered for centuries to come. His parents gave him the name Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. At the time of his birth, his father was a senior government official in India. His mother was a religious woman who taught her children about their religion, Jainism. Growing up, Gandhi believed in karma. This idea meant that to keep one's soul clean, a person should pray, have control, be honest, have few possessions, and be harmless. At age 13, Gandhi married according to the Jain tradition. His wife was also 13 years old. She was patient, strong, and fearless. Gandhi was a very shy boy. He feared ghosts and the dark. His wife loved him and laughed at him for sleeping with the lights on. Gandhi was a weak student. He barely graduated from Alfred High School and failed many classes in college. In 1888, he went to England to become a lawyer. Gandhi felt less important around others, so he decided to become an English gentleman. He dressed in fancy clothes and ate fancy foods and took dancing and violin lessons to show them that he was no less than them. Gandhi didn't feel happy with all of these things. He believed he could have learned violin back home in India. He gave up his fancy clothes, walked to places instead of taking public transportation, and joined the London Vegetarian Society. This made him much happier, but he still felt apart from the others. After spending three years in London, he passed his exams and returned to India. When Gandhi arrived in Bombay, his brother, Lakshmidas, met him at the dock and told him that their mother had died. This news broke Gandhi's heart, but he stopped his tears and showed his brother that he was happy.
I know that if I end up saving one, two, three girls, I'll know that everything that I've given up has had an impact on someone else's life. What I do here in Atlanta is I work in outreach from educating communities to working with colleges and just wherever that I can go and have people listen to what I have to say. It's not about trying to scare people about SGM or telling you guys what the horror is, but it's more about letting you guys know that this does happen to people. We want to have more platforms like this one. We want to go out to college because we want young women like you, even though you haven't been through FGM, because we know that you can relate to what happened to these women. <laughs> FGM is illegal in the United States as well as vacation cutting. That's when girls are sent abroad. A lot of people that practice FGM send their kids because they can't really do it here. So they send the kids usually in summer holidays and get them mutilated and then bring them back. People move here from all over. And when these people move here, they don't let go of their culture. You know, the way we dress, what we eat. We carry those things with us. And FGM is something that these people are very, very passionate about. They believe that it was handed down to them from their generations and generations and generations. With the more people that I have joining me, the more impact that we make, the more faces that they see, the more voices that they hear. And that's what I want. Oh, honey, thank you. Thank you. I decided to talk about FGM because I know that someone has to do it. You have these people that have been through what you're talking about. They don't, they can't stand up and say it because they, you know, it's fear. You have people that would threaten you, but that's, I'm not going to let some fear, I'm not going to let, you know, fear deter me from doing anything now. about a topic that is often cited. Some 30, some 30 or so uh, Cambridgeans of all ages and de demographics came together in a lecture hall uh, on the second floor of the Sherrill Library located on the Lesley University Brattle campus at uh, 89 Brattle Street to learn more about female general cutting or catna in the community of uh, Dawu Baharis, uh, India. Among the attendees at the uh, event was the Lesser University sophomore, Melanie uh, Matthew, 19. Matthew attended the event as a part of her honors program. She is currently a globalization court, in a globalization court, as a course that is discussing female general mutilation, and said that this event helped 
put the female genital mutilations in perspective for her since she had only been uh, reading uh, first personal accounts, meeting individuals who have lived through female genital mutilations and hearing their stories in the flesh, uh, in the flesh, made it feel more real and uh, urgent. So, uh, cutting a long story short, I was interested in the adopted material itself, entitled A Pinch of Skin. So if it's possible, I'm going to search that documentary, search for that documentary, and try to get you some uh, some segments of it right here uh, on your human service news and information. You know, uh, since I've been here at CCTV, I've always been trying to uh, present uh, uh, some type of presentation or, or a short, uh, brief uh, presentation on female genital mutilations, especially uh, as it relates to the Islamic countries, you know, and uh, but we find it throughout the earth in all countries. Somebody said, "We well, that's only a third world uh, problem. There's no female genital mutilation uh, here in the United States." Well, you're wrong because I had a, I had two prepared videos prepared to uh, shed light on female genital mutilation as a practice right here in the United States, but uh, I don't think time will permit. But uh, once again, I'm going to try to get this uh, a pinch of skin. A documentary on uh, you, but I'd like to interrupt right now since uh, we're just still in the uh, mid mid period. Well, I guess we're winding down. Black History Month is winding down, and uh, there's still several uh, events here in Cambridge that uh, I promised that I I, I try to uh, enlighten you about. That's happening right here. So, uh, uh, <laughs> but right now there's the 50 50 years since Martin Luther King Monday, Friday, 26, uh, 6 30 p.m. Main Library Lecture Hall at the uh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, okay. That's the Cambridge Public Library, okay. Uh, and uh, okay, the, that's uh, 26, okay. So that's uh, okay. There's a uh, there's another Black History event. Uh, on the 28th of February, that's uh, Youth Underground is a ensemble that creates and performs original theater and investigates social issues relating to young people. So it'll be at the uh, Cambridge Public Library on February 28th, uh, 6.30 p.m. at the main library. So uh, Black History Month is winding down and there's still several events for you too. But uh, I'm sure that uh, if you uh, check out CCTV's website and you're interested in and some things uh, in regards to Black History Month, you'll find them right here at cctvcambridge.org. And I advise you to uh, check that out soon because Black History Month won't be here uh, another week. Okay, uh, let's see what else did I have for you. Okay, um, okay, there's a, okay, there's the uh, MTW Annual Report. Okay, the official year 17. MTW annual report is now available for public comment. Her copies will be available at the Cambridge Housing Authority office at 362 Green Street, 3rd floor, starting Wednesday, and that's today, uh, February 22nd, 2018. Written comments may be submitted by mail or email and are due 5 p.m. Tuesday, March uh, 13, 2018. So if you like additional information about this uh, MTW, which is an acronym for Moving to Work, it's an annual report that's now available for public comment. So that's the uh, the authority, that's the authority uh, that the Cambridge Housing Authority has to do to conduct its affairs uh, in, in, in the uh, jurisdiction of Cambridge, okay? That's a federal uh, housing jurisdiction of Cambridge, and it's entitled the NTW Annual Report. It's something that they have to file annually. So you can get your copy uh, by uh, by going to the third floor, 362 Green Street floor, and that's uh, that's today. You start today. Written comments may be submitted by mail or email and are due by 5 p.m. That's Tuesday, March 13, 2018. So that's written comments due uh, Tuesday, March 13, 2018. So if you like additional information, once again, you can call Martha Ty. Martha Ty, that's a Cambridge Auditory, 362 Green Street, third floor, Cambridge. Uh, Mass 02139 Cambridge is uh, Cambridge Housing Authority has jurisdiction uh, with uh, federal subsidized uh, low renters housing in Cambridge and they must file an annual report to uh, report uh, to the government the housing urban development on their uh, <laughs> activities 
uh, in this jurisdiction. Okay, so that's uh, another thing that I'd like to remind you too. And if we have more time, I get into it with you. But you know, we just can't do everything in a short amount of time. That's allotted to us here at CCTV. So uh, <laughs> I didn't uh, share much with you today, but uh, it's Black History Month, and there's another thing I'd like to. Uh, uh, send out my condolences, deep sympathies to all the victims that uh, were just uh, life were cut short from a shooter, uh, unnatural catastrophe down in Florida. My deepest condolences go out to them, and also uh, Billy Graham, the late great evangelist uh, crusader, Christian crusader. Uh, the Christian world has lost a great champion, and that was the Dr. Uh, Billy Graham. So my condolences go out to him as well. Okay, I'm going to try to get this last video on uh, about female gender mutilation. Until next time, keep those being plays great, and don't forget to uh, assist someone in need of your help. What exactly is FGM? FGM is the non-medical practice that intentionally removes female genital organs. Often, girls are cut when they are still very young, in some cases, under the age of five.